we still have one more panel to go. <laughs> uh, I'm very aware that we are the last panel before the cocktails, so we, like to, we try to make this as interesting to you as possible. <laughs> Uh, we have a very huge topic, uh, which follows the theme of the whole day. So, like Catherine it very elegantly put, uh, how do we shape the future of international arbitration? Uh, in this panel, we'll focus on the question of what are the digital technologies and the overall trends that might become influential. And then we are trying to tackle the question of how should the arbitration community react to these tre trends and which trends should they start adopting. When we start with the title of, of the panel, uh, it's important to understand the word disruption. Uh, it's a term that is, has <coughs> become a very, very important buzzword nowadays, but originally it comes from a 1995 article by Clayton Christensen and Joseph Bauer, uh, who talked about business management, and they claimed that really disruptive technologies, those technologies that will affect how technologies are used in the future, those that change whole fields and whole markets and businesses, those really come from the market leaders. Instead, they come from the outsiders who are more able to perceive what might be the needs of their future clients. So bearing this in mind, uh, we are all insiders here uh, to law and to international arbitration. So now we are trying to ask the question, uh, is it possible that our community is able to disrupt itself or do we need somebody else to do it for us? So it's no small task we are taking over today. Um, technology is a part of this disruption but it's not just about technology, like Mera will be presenting in a, in a while. Uh, then a couple of words of, of introduction about our panelists. So here we have Professor Catherine Rogers, who gave her very elegant keynotes this morning. Then we have, have Michael Lind here, who is the expert on online dispute resolution, and we'll be talking about that in further detail. Then we have Mera Sivanathan, who's been very, very uh, enthusiastic host today, and she will bring us the perspective of legal design. And last but not least, we have Clemens Heusch from Nokia in Germany, who's going to bring us the corporate perspective to arbitration innovation and technology. And First, we're going to have short pitches, four of them, that will lead us to the theme and to these trends that we're going to talk about. And the order of the pitches are, I'm going to go first, uh, then we have Mike, then Mera, and then Catherine, and then Clemens has the job to comment on our pitches and take <laughs> us further to the actual conversation uh, on international arbitration. So, without further ado, I am going to need the slide changer. Okay. I have no idea how it works. Okay, like this. Yeah. So, I'm going to talk about the Legal Tech Lab which is an interdisciplinary research hub located at the law faculty of University of Helsinki. And the task that we have taken to ourselves is to find out how technology and the ongoing digitalization in society are changing the practice of law and global legal markets. Law has not been the first field to embrace technology, and some claim that we are very conservative when it comes technology, but like Petra already today in the, in the beginning of the day pointed out, there has been hype around technology for over 15 years now. But the thing is that the hype around technology and law is also partly a bubble. So our studies have established that the reality of technology used by lawyers does not always correspond with the discussions on technology use we are having. 
Startups are very, very active in the field of, of developing new applications of legal technologies, and there's a lot on offer from practice management and contract management to compliance tools and to legal analytics. However, the most important tools in the lawyer's toolkit, like all of you very well know, are still Google, Word, and email. <laughs> so, there is a strong discrepancy between the hype and the reality. And the big question is, how do we distinguish between that hype and the reality? What should arbitrators, what should legal counsels be doing so that they are on board with the future, but not just going for the hype? We believe that this is a really complex question that cannot be answered simply by talking about international arbitration, but instead it's a question that deals with all the legal disciplines. And because it's such a multifaceted complex question, it needs a holistic approach, an overview of the ongoing changes to be answered. We believe that our research hub is the way to find answers to these questions. Uh, since we started our work in late 2016, we have established that we are actually three things. First, we are a network of researchers and different research projects. Secondly, there's also core method and theory development, so systematization of law in, in simpler terms that is done in the lab's research projects. The lab is also a spearhead for external collaboration, which means that we try to make it easier to find the experts working on different intersections of law, technology and society, and make, make it easier to contact them. Our objectives are threefold, so we try to figure out what is going on, what is legal digitalization. The second thing is that we're trying to develop best practices. So how do we safeguard due process in digital dispute resolution, for example? And the third thing is also important. So we need to have fun. So it's also important to experiment with new tools uh, and see in concrete terms what's out there. And of course, the ultimate objective is to turn and establish Helsinki as the leading European research institute on these themes. We go about it in different ways, but the most important thing is to combine ambitious interdisciplinary research with an inclusive culture. We believe that digitalization of legal services is too important to be left only to the programmers, but it is also too important to leave it only for the lawyers. So we need a broader public open dialogue about these issues. And to have that dialogue, we need a place to have it. We also encourage student engagement and student volunteers partake in all of our events and all of our projects. And all of this work leads to nothing if there's not sufficient knowledge mobilization. So all the information we produce needs to be openly shared and disseminated. At the moment, there's me and a postdoc, plus our affiliated researchers. Then there's a coordinator, assistant, uh, PhD students, as well as student volunteers. And our research has established that there are certain focus areas that need to be tackled, where research is directly needed. And at the moment, our key focus is on algorithmic fairness which we actually explore in a project funded by the Prime Minister's Office on algorithmic decision-making. So the points that were raised during the last session about automating legal decision-making and thinking of augmenting those decision-making processes with the help of technologies. Uh, in addition to this project, last year we doubled with access to legal information, working from the assumption that access to information is the mandatory first uh, prerequisite for access to justice. We also doubled in trying to organize a hackathon, a research-based hackathon, where interdisciplinary research uh, student teams tried to find prototypes and concepts that would improve access to information. This spring, we are also working 
uh, doing empirical work with legal professions and looking into the IT skills of lawyers and their attitudes towards digitalization and also what should be done uh, at the university education level to improve the skill sets of future lawyers. If you're interested in our work, here's a couple of dates. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we are organizing an international conference here in Helsinki on law and AI, and again, trying to distinguish between the hype and the reality. Then we are organizing the second round of Hack the Law, also research-based, in October. And then we have an official slush side event where legal tech startups are pitching their ideas. Uh, in December. So if you're interested in any of these activities, please come and join or go to our web page to find out more. Thank you. <clears throat> and Mike, I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Michael Lind. I'm a lawyer and a mediator, and I'm based in the UK, but I work with a very large uh, tech company uh, called Tyler Technologies, listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and works primarily in the private, in the in the public sector, providing software services. But I'm just going to quickly walk you through uh, the concept of sort of ODR, but just giving you three examples of um, ODR. And the first one, which I suppose many of you might be familiar with, was uh, really pioneered by my colleague and good friend Colin Rule when he was at eBay. And that was really just a very simple um, uh, connection mechanism to put vendors and purchasers in touch with each other to resolve disputes. The software system that he built was really the first one dealing with online dispute resolution. And even today, the software that um, powers it, our software, resolves about 60 million disputes per annum. 90% of those without human intervention. So literally just allowing the parties to communicate to each other on a platform. And when um, Colin left eBay, he set up a company called Modria, and we started developing and taking that uh, a bit further into the private sector. And one of the um, key clients that they developed, picked up um, fairly soon, was the American Arbitration Association. And the scheme, which I just want to walk you through, um, deals with the no-fault insurance claim uh, pers um, personal injury scheme for motor vehicle accidents in New York. It's a no-fault liability process. Originally, all the cases that the AAA handled were done through the court system. And typically, the cases took about three to five years to get resolved. Now, these are not huge cases. They're not, um, they're not sort of the core claims of uh, compensation. It's all about claiming of medical expenses, lost income, and really personal related issues, but they're all resolved um, involving claims with insurance companies, and they handle around about 250,000 cases per annum. But they took the decision to move it away from the courts because it was too slow and give it to the American Arbitration Association, and that happened in about 2012. And they put all those cases onto the Modria platform. So even today, we handle about 300,000 arbitrations through the American, Arbit uh, American Arbitration Association, just on this one scheme alone. And just to give you a flavor of it, it's all online, so all the submissions, all the applications, all the, the um, evidence is all uploaded onto the platform uh, by both parties. It also allows lawyers and their representatives to be involved, if that's appropriate in, the, in individual cases. And the entire case is managed by the American Arbitration Association staff. There are about 100 arbitrators who are appointed full-time to manage these cases. And if you think about it, 100 arbitrators, 300,000 cases. On average, these arbitrators do 3,000 cases per annum. Now, that's quite significant. And Michael was talking about the sort of the split between um, low-value, um, less complex cases. Most of these are low-value, less um, complex. The issues are quite... Uh, similar throughout the cases, but they're all, they're still in the tens and twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollar cases. They're not tiny cases like eBay. So you're already seeing that slight progression into more complex cases. 
Um, one of the key things which the technology does allow is the scheduling of media, the arbitrators to these cases. All the arbitrators' availability is logged into the system. The system allocates and appoints all the arbitrators according to their availability, location, experience. Everything is factored into this. And the hearings are done in a face-to-face -face environment at various different locations, and each hearing is only 15 minutes long. So primarily all the evidence is assessed by the arbitrator beforehand on a paper-based submission. But the parties are given that little window, 15-minute window, literally to say, is there anything else that you want me to consider? And I'll factor that into my, my, my thinking. So that's one example. And I, you know, Michael was talking about the transition into, into more complex cases. And I think that will happen on that. But it's a really um, illustrative example of how efficiency can be driven. When it was within the court system, these cases took three to five years. On our platform, they take three to five months. So quite a significant saving. And the biggest hurdle when we set it up was all the lawyers saying, we don't like this, we're going to lose revenue. All the lawyers now are making the same revenue faster because they can do more cases more efficiently than they could do before. And that's always an issue when we're talking about online dispute resolution. Second um, example I want to give is in England, where we provide software services to CEDA, Centre for Effective Dispute Resolution in London. And that is to provide the online dispute resolution platform for the resolution of um, aviation claims. Under EU legislation, if you are denied boarding or the aircraft is late, by more than three hours you are entitled to compensation. A number of these schemes exist in Europe. Ours is quite effective. It follows on directly from the airline's own schemes. We run about, um, handle the, about 90% of aircraft flying in UK airspace on our platform, and all the disputes that um, aren't resolved satisfactorily come onto our platform. And it's, again, it's a system which APIs an automatic connector back into the airline system to download information onto our platform. Parties are, are able to upload additional information to the platform. It's not pure arbitration, but it's actually we call it adjudication. Um, but once the submissions are made, the adjudicator um, facilitates a quick discussion with the parties to see if they can try and make a final offer of settlement or final resolution. Otherwise, the adjudicator will make an award. And it's you know, an incredibly efficient system, but we had a huge volume in the US. In the UK, we do about 22,000, 23,000 of these cases per year through CEDA. So that's not insignificant as a, as a, a really viable, active ODR project that's already got traction. And we're already expanding that into other areas of traffic and insurance and uh, rail disputes. So we, you can see we are moving along this journey. It's quite exciting. Um, I'm thrilled to be involved with it and happy to participate in the discussion as we go on. Thank you. Mera, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rika. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I just wanted to start today by thanking the organizers of HIAD 2018 and Haiti and Petra and their team for inviting me here today to present the outcome of a legal design project that we have been working on together. So, uh, to start off, what is legal design? Some of you may be very familiar with it, others not as much. So just to recap, basically it's a holistic approach to legal problem solving and legal innovation. And it's looking at combining strategic design thinking with legal expertise to create solutions that are more engaging, user-friendly, transparent, and easy to understand for the end user. Um, at the heart of design thinking, it's basically looking at the designer's mindset, the way that they approach problem solving. And at the heart of that is empathy and a human-centric approach. So that's really gaining an understanding of your end user's needs, wants, goals, desires, and using that as a basis to then form a solution. And that'll ultimately result in a solution that will resonate with your end user. And of course, we would then implement a solution which is technologically feasible and take into account economic viability. So legal design is what I specialize in. 
And so when I'm not hosting Hired 2018, I am the lead legal designer at Dot Deer Attorneys, which is a um, law firm based here in Helsinki, Berlin and San Francisco, working in all areas of law like arbitration as well as technology. And earlier this year in March, we rolled out a sub-brand called DOT, which is a legal design consultancy focusing on using the legal design approach to help all stakeholders in the legal environment to create these more engaging, user-friendly, transparent legal solutions and services and products. And so that is where my journey with the FAI began. Haiti had attended the Legal Design Summit in November last year, and after that, she, she had, the, had the vision, really. Um, true to what Catherine said about Finnish people being quite innovative by nature, and she said, I want to look at, looking, I want to look at um, doing something with legal design within the arbitration sphere. So um, we'll start, we, we started small, you know, Let, let's see how we can improve um, accessibility to arbitration, um, looking at the website, and the FAI website. And so Haiti said, told us about a few um, challenges currently within, uh, faced within arbitration and alternate dispute re resolution. First is that many people perceive the process to be complex. Um, there's not necessarily a clear structure for people who aren't familiar with the process to just look at and easily understand. So that can sometimes play a barrier to people opting into arbitration as being a choice of uh, dispute resolution. And then, of course, she said, you know, there's no one-stop shop. Like, where can someone just go and find out everything that they need to know from a pragmatic perspective? So business leaders, you know, where can they go and understand not only the process, but time and cost and whatever else may be important for them in a, at a strategic level? So the scope of our project was to design and develop a solution that is engaging, pragmatic from a business perspective, and will help potential users easily understand the arbitration process. So this is a high-level overview of the legal design project that we undertook. And I'll go through each of those um, components uh, with you just a bit, just shortly. So first of all, there's inspiration. Because, you know, the legal industry needs inspiration. We need to bring that in a bit more. Um, ideation, prototyping, so creating the solution and then implementing. So with the kickoff workshop, we first identified what materials are we currently working with? What materials do people have access to to gain an understanding of the arbitration process? And I'm sure all of you have been on the FAI website. It's great. There's a whole bunch of information. Um, that you can find about the process and everything you need. But Haiti said, you know, I want something that people can go to as a first port of call. They can find out the information there and then dig deeper if they want to. And then, of course, there's the arbitration rules, which for lawyers are very useful, but for, for a business person or a business leader within an organisation, probably don't want to touch that as a start. You know, it's not very efficient to look at. So as I said, um, the whole legal design process is focused on first understanding the users and what's important to them. So we've held a legal design workshop, and essentially that was with people within the FAI from both a legal and non-legal background, as well as the Chamber of Commerce and other kind volunteers who attended on the day. And uh, we first started off by getting them to think about and putting themselves in the perspective of the user. So this is a very common tool used in design thinking, personas. So put yourself in the mindset of the business leader and the lawyer. And now let's take a look at the arbitration process from their perspective. You know, which parts are important to them? And um, following on from what Michael actually said, um, generally it's not really the process itself, but it's the outcomes that people within business are really interested in, right? And so you can see here, we had the timeline. It was, it's very hands-on, and it's quite a different way to problem-solving than that we as lawyers are quite used to. 
Um, yeah, so we mapped out the different bottlenecks and pain points within the arbitration process as well to get a better idea of what information is important to people, you know, not only the steps, but from a business leader's perspective, you know, I want to know how much is it going to cost up front and what's the time frame and how can I enforce the, my award or at what point, how long will it take for an award to be uh, um, given? Once we got the results from the workshop, we then went back and we analysed all the different points of view and then came up with a prototype of what we could um, implement on the website, which would be a some, a some form of timeline, but that would have an element of interactability so people could find the information that they want when they want. The next important step with the whole legal design approach is actually validating what you design, right? Because a lot of the time, people will design something and roll it out, and then it just flops. So legal tech, for example, you're, you're designing legal technology, but then a lot of the time, it goes into the market, and only lawyers think it's great. But the users themselves are a bit like, not sure if I, I quite understand how it works. So we held a um, user validation workshop, and we were very fortunate that top business executives from big companies here in Finland, as well as general counsel from other large companies, gave up their time to participate. And they took a look at the prototype that we created and gave us some more feedback. And so now, let's actually take a look at the end result. Um, I'll invite you to take out your mobile phones. Do not check your emails sneakily. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, join me as we look at the final result of what we've created. All right, so this is the arbitration process. How easy does it look? Um, let's look at it from first from a high-level perspective. What you can see here is, oh, sorry, a timeline. So immediately you can tell your clients, as a lawyer, print this out. You can show your clients how long the process is going to be. Um, for anyone who isn't familiar with the uh, arbitration process, they can see straight away all the different steps that they will need to take, as well as the important information that they may need, such as, um, you know, when payments might be made or timing of certain decisions, as well as further information, such as um, when would I actually need to be physically present or when do documents need to be lodged. So that's, that's first of all, from what they can see by just printing that out. But it is also interactive, so it can be used as a tool to find out further information as well. For example, if I want to know more about arbitration, oh, sorry, a simple click, and I can find out more about the process. If I want to know, as a lawyer, perhaps, um, what information do I need to include in the statement of defense, you can easily go directly to your relevant sections in the act by clicking on links. Oh, which, apologies. And now you're taken directly to the relevant sections of the Arbitration Act. You don't need to scurry around trying to find out. Practical information also, such as um, how, do I how do I file a um, request for arbitration? Drop down, you can see your payments, you can find your filing form, you can even find the exact details of the BSB for which you need to make payment to. So everything is there in one centralised place and we hope it'll be a really helpful tool for business leaders, for lawyers to easily explain the process and find the relevant sections of the Act, as well as for in-house counsel who perhaps need to also report to other people within their organisation, where are we within the arbitration proceedings? can simply say, oh, we're in step nine, take a look at the attached PDF and if you need any more information, just drop down and you can see, find, find that out further. So I invite you all to use this tool and we would really love to hear feedback because of course we'd like to develop it so that it is completely user friendly. That's a really great example of how the FAI has been using legal design and it's been a wonderful pleasure to work with them. Thank you.
So there's a slideshow. There we go. Okay, so I, I do love bumblebees, as you all know, uh, but this is my passion project. Okay, this is, this is uh, something I've been working on now for over 12 years. It grows out of my scholarship, and although I would only reluctantly disagree with Rika on one point, and maybe only halfway, I don't consider myself an international arbitration insider in the sense that I do not sit as an arbitrator, and I do not uh, intentionally take, you know, accept assignments to write um, opinions as an expert. And that's quite intentional because this is a nonprofit, uh, and I think it also is really important to be independent. So the original idea for arbitrator intelligence, we have to start by thinking about how are arbitrators selected. Okay, you have an international dispute. Uh, you have in mind what you need, you know, a type of law, but you also have in mind some intangibles or some less uh, clear goals. You desperately need interim relief, and you want to make sure you're going to be able to either get lots of documents or avoid the other side's request for document production. You want to, in other words, learn about an arbitrator's soft skills and proclivities beyond their formal legal training that would be available on their CV. So what do you do? You get a, a short list of arbitrators, three or five, based on the objective criteria. Where did they go to school? Do they have experience sitting uh, in the fin you know, under the Finnish rules? Okay. But then you're really stumped. How do you find out this other information that's really critical to your case? Well, the, te the prevailing technology for finding that information out is the telephone, 19th century technology. Right? You call everyone you know and ask. Have you appeared before this arbitrator? Have you ever sat with this arbitrator? <laughs> uh, well, oftentimes people will initiate the request to find out who they can call through an email, um, but oftentimes it's followed up with a phone call. Now, here are a couple problems with the phone calls. One, it can be difficult to identify uh, who you might be able to call, and more importantly, uh, it depends on who you are, whether you can even make phone calls. What do I mean by that? If you are an attorney at Freshfields, if you are an attorney at Deborah Boyce and Plimpton, okay, you send out an email saying, does anyone know these arbitrators? Okay, and follow it by phone calls. You have dozens of people you can call. You also have in-house hundreds of awards and your own experience from hundreds of cases that your firm has handled. When we talk about diversity, if you are the leading law firm in Peru or in Nigeria, okay, you can't, you, when you send out your email, you don't get back nearly as many names of people you can call. And you might get the names of people who can, you can call, but if they don't know you, you're going to get really different information than their friend who's called them from Freshfields. I'm not picking on Freshfields, it's a fantastic firm, that's why I'm sort of identifying it. But what that means is, the telephone technology, you can have the opposing sides in the same case call the same person and ask the same question about the same arbitrator and get two different responses based on how well that person knows you. That is a profound information asymmetry. Okay? And it's because we rely on 19th century technology Arbitrator, information, arbitrator intelligence seeks to change that. <clears throat> we are what you might call an information intermediary and aggregator. <clears throat> and we, we, we a lot of different ways you can think about us, but one way is as a technology platform. Just as Uber tries to match up drivers okay, with passengers, we are trying to gather information from people who have it about arbitrators and provide it in a much more subtle way than Uber operates, let's say, uh, to people who need that information. Okay, how are we doing this? The primary tool we have is the Arbitrator Intelligence Questionnaire, or for short, AIQ. Okay, and the idea behind the AIQ is that at the end of each case, people will either go voluntarily to our website or receive an email from an institution saying, hey, now you've completed your case, fill out an AIQ. Okay, it has two phases. The first phase is based only on information from the award. When was the case filed? What was the industry? The amount in dispute? Okay, what was the amount awarded? What was you know, the close of proceedings? The date of the uh, issuance of the award? Objective information? Most importantly, the names of the arbitrators. Okay? At the end of phase one, the person who completes phase one 
It can be a junior attorney, could be an intern, one of uh, Michael's interns, okay? And they uh, complete phase one. At the end, they're invited to nominate someone to take phase two. Phase two asks that information that we were talking about that's so important when you're trying to appoint an arbitrator, but you cannot currently find out except now through phone calls. Let me give you an example. Again, it depends on the region, and not every region is the same, but in some countries, it's really important to be able to get document production. In other countries, it's really important, especially if you're up against an American party, to not let them get lots of document production, okay? So in phase two of our questionnaire, we have an initial question. Did the parties request document production? If the answer is no, in Latin America, 90% of the cases, I'm told, they don't ask for a get document production. End of story. If they say yes, though, then we say, who, who requested it? Was it granted? And then we ask, and this is a sample question from phase two of the questionnaire, if document production was granted, after those first two questions, what standard was used to, to order the parties to uh, produce documents? And these are roughly categories based on the IBA rules on the taking of evidence in international arbitration. Okay. Uh, again, these are three objective questions. There's no uh, evaluation of the arbitrators. We do follow up with a, with a question evaluating what pe in people's thoughts on the, on the document production. But here's what we're going to do with this information when we have enough of it. Okay. We are going to generate what we call arbitrator intelligence reports. These will be individual reports collectivizing and analyzing the data we have from arbitrators. Now, this is intentionally simplified for the purposes of this demonstration, and I should highlight that this is hypothetical data, um, not based on a real arbitrator. But let's say you wanted, you're, you're in a document, you know, trying to figure out document production because you either want it or don't. You could have a comparison of the arbitrator you're looking at compared to, for example, all the other arbitrators in oil and gas cases that we have on file, or compared to all other oil and gas cases above a certain dollar amount or below a certain dollar amount to see how they compare to this average. You have a baseline. And now that you can't get through a phone call. If you're lucky you get three or four people you speak to, you have no idea if those are outliers or you know, right in the median. Okay. The other, and this is a really hot uh, and important topic, I know, particularly for Michael, okay, we also should be able to analyze, for example, time to issue an award. Again, this is hypothetical data. It's intentionally simplified. For example, what we might do in the future is color code the little X's um, for each institution or for the ICC, because there's a time period for reviewing the award. It might not be a dot, but it might be a little bit of a bar to, to take into account for timing the institutional review and for other institutions that review awards. And again here, you can, you can uh, identify the arbitrator and either the, our full sample, all the cases we have on file, or a subset compared to other cases in oil and gas above or below a certain amount to get a baseline for how quick or slow this arbitrator is. You can see this is a very well-behaved arbitrator who generally renders awards more quickly than the average. Okay? Um, so we, um, the, the uh, arbitrator intelligence questionnaire, because I'm told I'm supposed to be very, very quick, it was longer than I'm supposed to be, but the questionnaire is available on our website. Uh, this is really just a taste, a very quick uh, flash uh, presentation. Uh, there are a lot more questions I'm sure you have. Many of them are available answers on our website. I would also urge you to look at our truly phenomenal board of advisors and board of directors who are helping us develop the, uh, award, the, excuse me, the reports and the technology for doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, okay, let's start the panel, and I'll give the first uh, first comment to Clement. So, uh, what thoughts do, do these pitches make you think? And kind of like, what is your your um, where do you come from to these themes? Well, first of, first of all, Rika, thank you very much for this introduction. I was highly impressed because I thought I was, was doing a lot of arbitration, but most of these tools I've never heard about, to be very <laughs> honest. Mm -hmm. I kind of liked your initial comment where you said, what is hype and what is reality? So we at Nokia, just to give you a very rough picture, we make, let's say, maybe five, six, seven arbitrations per year. I would say one is a really big one. The other ones are more kind of mid-size. Um, and um, we are actually very simple, very 
simple-minded customers. We only want to win, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's not quite that simple. We want to win for, uh, for a low price and with, <laughs> with a low investment. And it's not only the money which counts. There are many other things which count, which are, for example, capacities of our employees. So, for example, if you tell that you need one of our, or a couple, five, ten of our most important inventors to come to New York ICC center and sit there for four weeks and three weeks rehearsal and then the day before the testimony probably the other side drops them or whatever. Yeah. So they, these are things we want to avoid. So we really need to make smart use of our resources. And so therefore, um, I think arbitration does have a lot of flexibility. Arbitration is certainly more flexible than state court because in arbitration you basically can agree with the other side, with the institution, with the tribunal on, I would say, more or less everything. Whereas state courts usually have procedural rules which are a uh, formal act which cannot easily be changed. Otherwise, you risk that the decision would be overturned. I have really some shocking examples I mean, uh, uh, I hope we don't have any Americans. No, we do have Americans. <laughs> I, I can take it. <laughs> okay. No, but um, you see, we had some big patent disputes, and if I saw the depositions, it was a nightmare. We had a caravan of, I would say, 20, 30 highly paid people traveling for six weeks around the world just to interview the eighth co-inventor somewhere in Tanzania or so. <laughs> I am really wondering, is that necessary? Does that make sense? Does it make the decision better? But just not to blame only the US, vice versa, I am a German-trained uh, lawyer. We had the same in Germany. We had a case at the Munich court about co-inventorship. And obviously, there was one witness in the US who was not able to travel. German civil procedural law does not allow video conferences because behind the video camera, you see there at the back of the room, there could be somebody with big signs telling me what to say and right next to him another guy with a gun. So, so just to show me <laughs> what would happen in case I do not give the proposed answers. Just to, to exclude that, and as said, Germans are here very, um, very formal. They do not allow any video conference, meaning in that case, the entire regional court Munich was traveling to Dallas. Three judges, a bunch of lawyers, um, a bunch of party representatives. For the lawyers, was a great. Uh, sorry, for the judges, it was a great one-time experience. So they all booked their holidays in Las Vegas. I think right there, right <laughs> thereafter. Um, no, but still, that is not how we want to do it. And now coming back to Hypey, um, we are a Finnish company. We are a technology company. So we have all the preconditions to be open to new technology and to the smart use. But as I said, smart use. It must be used smart, not just because it's so hypey, but because it really facilitates our cases. And now coming back to um, exactly these cases, if you can do video conferences, we did this in arbitration, that is certainly something which is very good. Another uh, thing are things like um, e-document management. In some cases, we have hundreds of files of, com uh, of documents, of agreements, of emails, whatever, what had to be produced. I came to the arbitration room, there was a hotel room in Washington. There was an entire wall full of shelves, full of uh, files. Unbelievable. I, I bet none of the arbitrators has ever looked at them. But, but they all had to be printed out, had to be shipped uh, from, from the three locations where the arbitrators were located to Washington, D.C. All these things, in my view, do not really make sense. Transcripts. I am sometimes really impressed when I'm, for example, in UK High Court, how great these these computer-based transcripts are working working these days. They understand much more than me as a German with my limited English skills. So really, if there are words I don't understand, I just look on the screen. The the, the software does understand it, and all the abbreviations, everything, they got it. Um, and they even take out of the transcripts all my ams and ers and these kind of stuff. So they are really good. So that what I'm saying, there is really good use for this. And for example, in arbitration, selection of the arbitrators is in my um, view the absolute key to the entire case. And therefore that kind of information is extremely valuable. I still do it the 1900 <laughs> way. I still take my the telephone. I ask everybody I know who could possibly have some information. But of course, such a tool is great. And to be honest, it reminded me a little bit of my of my um, bar exam when I took that in Germany. We had an oral exam with three practitioners. I never heard before. I never knew. One was a university professor. One was a public prosecutor, and one was a 
I think, four more judge. And of course, everybody was excited to know how are they, what do, kind of questions do they ask. And there, the student union, they provided transcripts, so I could go to the student union, could copy all kind of available transcripts. I had to make a deposit of 50 euros, which was a lot of <laughs> money at that time. And only if I delivered my own transcripts, I got the deposit back. And it a little bit reminded me of that, and it was very useful. So I am impressed, and we as, 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 a, as a user of the system, we are absolutely open to all these kind of tools if we believe they can make our life easier, they can give us better better, more predictable, more reliable decision in short time for reasonable money, absolutely welcome. Well, that was a very comprehensive comment, thank <laughs> you. Uh, okay, actually, Clemens, you raised uh, already one of the issues that I actually wanted to ask all the panelists. So, we are talking about technology, but technology is a broad term uh, and it goes far beyond the 19th century telephones. So, my first question actually is, what do you consider to be arbitration technology? Clemens mentioned document management systems uh, and Michael was talking about online dispute resolution and online arbitration. Uh, also, in legal technology field, uh, we talk about technologies such as communication platforms, e-discovery, client portals, uh, all sorts of different applications. But So my first question is, what do you think is the most influential and most important technology, and why? Uh, Michael already pointed out uh, about the question of augmented dispute resolution, so not all of the processes online. Uh, Clemens pointed out about efficiency and cost savings, and Catherine's point was transparency, whereas Mera talked about the user perspective and serving better the actual clients. So deriving from these standpoints, what technologies are most important and why? For international arbitration specifically, as opposed to just legal practice generally? Uh, I would suggest <laughs> you hold it in international arbitration, but if nothing comes, then... Yeah, yeah they, they sort of overlap with some of them. So, so as the non-practitioner, I'm not sure I'm right, the right person <laughs> to start with. Um, but uh, but I, I think that there are, I mean, cl clearly the, the, the hearing room has transformed, right? You know, now you, you sit there and you have, a, you know, this, this, your screen, the screen of what's, uh, in, including some of the technology, I suppose, that translates even to conferences. But, um, and I, I think some of the other technologies are, are ones that have been mentioned, right? That you don't have to ship things around the world as much. Uh, you can, you know, transfer them electronically. Um, the arbitration specific ones, I think the arbitral institutions are also doing a lot to upgrade their internal case management software. Uh, and in terms of arbitration specific technology, apart from arbitrator intelligence, <laughs> uh, I think that might be one of the most important because they're managing uh, electronically on a platform uh, much more than a, a court necessarily would because they have a much more active role. Um, than, than like a clerk of a court, which just kind of receives and sends, and, and so and they do it much more physically. So I would say probably what the institutions are doing, um, some institutions, and I think we'll see as, as Michael suggested a lot more of that in the future. Yeah. So especially case management system, case and document management systems because of uh, time yeah. and cost savings. Yeah. If I may make a comment. I think at the moment it is, that is the case, it is most about efficiency, about cost saving, but um, to um, continue on what Michael said earlier, he spoke about this artificial intelligence, I was a little shocked when I heard that kind of a computer making my decision, but um, we discussed it a little bit, bit in the break, and of course it will not be invented tomorrow morning, 9, 9 a.m., but there are a lot of slow steps, and if we think about this a little bit, many of these steps have already been taken and I was when I heard uh, when I listened to Richard about um, sports arbitration I was thinking when I was last year in Wimbledon not sure whether one of you has been there oops I think that's not compliant with our policy anyway let's forget about that um, um, I was there and and every player had the possibility to object, I think, two points per set or something like that. And then there was a big screen and you saw in super slow motion how the ball approached the line and it was a little bit outside, inside, on the line, next to the line. It was not a camera, it was not a slow motion camera, but it was, it was um, there were sensors and there was a computer and an algorithm calculating it. And 
honestly, on the lawn with this, all this grass and the ball touching by half a millimeter the last grass on yes or no, I never really trusted that. But <laughs> obviously, obviously, the players did. If the camera showed there was the slightest um, um, touch between the line and the ball, they accepted that the ball was in. And if it didn't touch, it was out. So there was a decision purely made by a computer. So maybe we see this in a couple of years in 100 million dollar cases. I still still sounds, sounds a little scary, but we are moving towards that direction probably. Yeah. So algorithmic content creation and autonomous decision making because of what is the reason? Why do you think this is the most influential thing? Well, there might be situations. I mean, as I said, I'm conservative. I'm still glad that humans are somehow involved. But there might be decisions where algorithms might be in a better position to decide, maybe to maybe they have, they are neutral, they are not influenced by anybody. We are all humans, and we are all influenced by something. I mean, nobody probably can say that he's absolutely blind as Justicia is supposed to be. Um, there are certainly some upsides, and um, it might, if these algorithms are really working well, that might make in the end the decisions maybe even more predictable, maybe even more just, maybe. Perfect. Yeah. Michael, what are and your thoughts? I think the um, ability to do e-filing and case management is absolutely critical to any of these processes because they are document-heavy processes and you've got to have an efficient and easy-to-use system. How do you navigate all those those boxes on the wall in, in, in Washington if it's a digital file? It's really it's quite challenging to build that and to make it easily accessible because that's what the judges or the arbitrators are going to need, as will counsel on, on both sides. So I do think a very robust uh, case management system is absolutely critical to it. I think we touched on very briefly the issue of security. I think as we go into this world of um, digital innovation and dealing with you know, pretty complex issues, it's all up in a cloud somewhere. How do, you, how do we really ensure security of information and documentation across the globe when, when we're talking about international arbitration. So I think that's one issue which certainly we take very seriously, but it is, it, it's a lot more difficult to maintain than I think people give, um, give a lot of thought to. And the last issue is really just usability. I think it's easy to talk about, well, it's an ODR system, it's an online system. Well, what does that actually mean? From a user's perspective, it doesn't matter whether it's the client, the, the uh, council, the arbitrator, they just need something which is easy and simple to use. And I think there's a lot of um, skill in actually making that happen. And I remember Colin Rule always said at eBay, he said, you've got to make these processes intuitive to someone who just doesn't understand how to use it on a daily basis. When we're working with law firms and cases all the time, you tend to get a little bit blasé, thinking, well, everyone knows how it works. But actually, the vast majority of people don't find it easy to navigate. So I think from a design perspective, the simplicity of use is absolutely critical. Yeah. Well, I, I obviously couldn't agree more <laughs> with you <laughs> there, Michael. And um, similar to Catherine, I, I probably wouldn't identify myself as an insider to arbitration. I do have a degree in law, and I worked mainly in M&A at a big American law firm back in Sydney. I have a degree in business, and I have postgraduate studies in design thinking. So I can't comment specifically on what technology would be beneficial for the arbitration um, sector itself, but obviously very much agree with my panel here today. But I, I would like to make comment on technology more broadly. Um, there's a really uh, well-known, he, he calls himself a futurist actually, uh, probably because the word future is cool, but um, <laughs> he's a philosopher of today. His name's Gerd Leonhard, he's from Switzerland, and uh, basically he, he's written this book called Technology Versus Humanity, and he has some great thoughts about the impact of technology and how it's going to change our society today. Um, basically what he said that um, digitalization, um, automation, different technologies, AI, machine learning, smart contracts, that's, that's going to happen. And if you don't embrace that, it, you're not going to keep up with the time. So that's a given. But um, what he says is that anything that cannot be automated or digitalized, that is where the real value in the future is going to be. So 
your clients, um, people using any of these tools, they're going to expect it to be streamlined and easy to use. But then where is that human aspect? That's what's going to be valuable. Like how you then, as arbitrators or lawyers in the industry, how you then still use those techn technological tools, but then um, use your own skill set, the soft skills, to connect with the ultimate end user. So I actually think that's the way that the future is going to go, where technology must be embraced, it's going to be a given, and that these other soft skills and our ability to des design um, services, processes, proceedings in a way that people can really use um, effectively is going to be the way of the future. Interesting. Uh, I'm going to take a hold of what you said about automation. And, and a lot of research is done at the moment uh, pointing to the direction uh, that routine cognitive tasks are the first to be automated. And this is something that we are already seeing. So in big law firms, uh, for example, uh, already from starting already in the 80s uh, there's much much less secretary work than there used to be because of automate automated systems but we don't really often consider it as automation because it's something that has already happened and the same thing with ai but to broaden on this uh, so if routine cognitive tasks are being automated and the value in is in those processes where human intervention is necessary. Uh, what do you panelists consider to be the adoption rate of technology right now? So is the arbitration community embracing the technology or not? And I'm making the assumption that not as much as the hype would suggest. <laughs> if you agree with this statement, uh, please elaborate what do you think are the reasons behind it. Well, start well, well, if I, I may start, I think, as I mentioned earlier, that the arbitration community is ahead of, let's say, at least many state courts. Mm -hmm. As said, the systems are more flexible and also, especially in international cases, if you have if the clients are big companies, they are also quite demanding in that regard. So I think they are ahead. But of course, there's always room for improvement, and we are not yet at the at the top of the of the mountain. And there are, of course, a number of reasons. One of the reasons is that, for example, in-house people like me, we are open to all of that, but only to a degree where it is, for example, tested, reliable, and so on. Like I, we usually don't want to be the pioneers on new technology, and if it completely goes wrong, then I go to my management and say, sorry, I thought it was worth a try. Uh, that is difficult. So, of course, <laughs> that is, and, 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 but also in the arbitration community, um, here in, in, in Finland, we see a lot of young people, but if you go to the same event in other countries in the world, the average age is maybe 20 years older, and that might also be one of the reasons why the openness for new technology is not always that big. Mm. I think there's a number of factors which come together. I, I can add something. One thing that's already sort of uh, reactions we've received on arbitrator intelligence our biggest, our most enthusiastic constituency are young people because they see technology uh, as a great democratizer and they're trying to think about how are they going to make their careers in international arbitration when it's this kind of tight-knit cadre that currently uh, has, a, has a pretty good lock because the information is exchanged by telephone. Uh, so on the one hand, I think they, again, see technology as, as creating opportunities for them. And two, they're not afraid of it because they grew up on this stuff, right? So the idea that you get evaluated and that people are going to you know, submit information about you is second nature to them uh, because they grew up with Uber where you Get, you evaluate not only the driver but the passenger. Um, but I think that there is also a generational gap. I think there are, we've certainly heard from some arbitrators who are uh, anxious about it. We have a number of protections substantively built in uh, to, to protect arbitrators from you know, sort of unfair reviews. But just the notion that there's going to be feedback uh, and that it's going to be collected uh, is, I think, uh, anxiety producing for some, not all, uh, but for some, and, and I think that divides by age. Uh, it's at least partially. 
And I think also, just to be sort of cynical as a lawyer, you know, it's, it's also a question of Turkey's voting for Christmas. You know, there's a, there's a lot of money to be made in arbitration. We build our families around it. We build our businesses around it. We are very skilled as professionals running the practices as we do at the moment. And that's very, a, a very much a human interaction uh, role that we're playing with parties who are desperately affected by a dispute, whether that's a corporate dispute or a, or a private dispute or an investor state issue, as we heard this morning. So I think there are a lot of really sort of vested interests, and that creates a degree of inertia. And some of the programs that we're working on, for instance, with Modria and Tyler, you know, they're, they're really small little blocks of success stories. And I think on a sort of a Gartner scale, I think, you know, these little success stories, we've got to get them right. There's no point saying we're going to make arbitration digital by, you know, 2022 or something like that. It's not going to happen like that. It's going to be an incremental cycle. And that's interesting hearing Michael talking about sort of five and 10 and 25 year vision. I think it'd be, it's very difficult to say how quickly it's going to happen. I do think the rate of adoption will speed up as we have more success stories and we, we're careful about what types of cases do we think would benefit from a digitalization. You know, it's not the complex cases necessarily that you're talking about, although technology can help make those be more efficiently managed through better case filing and better digital processes to, to secure and transfer cases. But, but in terms of sort of um, uh, across the piece, it's, 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 it is going to be driven by success. It's not going to be driven by technology saying this is out there. And the issue we haven't spoken about so far is also um, a big issue on, on the international ish, uh, platform is language. You know, are we expecting these digital platforms to auto-translate all these nuances, these legal legally specific terms and looking in the whites of someone's eyes, someone's eyes to, to work out exactly what they're saying. How do we, how do we translate some of that um, in terms of, you know, that's what mediators and arbitrators are trained in. But uh, from a technical perspective, it's very, very difficult to just rely on Google Translate in an arbitration because it's going to make a mistake. It's not there yet. The technology is not there to run an arbitration using a... a, a an auto-translate model yet. It will get there, but it's not there at the moment. So that, for me, is one big factor, probably limiting the growth of international arbitration in the short term. Mm -hmm. But it, it is improving. What do you think? Uh, if I summarize a bit, so uh, reliability is an issue. So these systems should be foolproof, and as long as they crash or there's language issues or other uncertainties, uh, they will not be adopted because we need foolproof systems. Uh, then the point that Catherine raised about the uh, conservative nature of the profession, which then again is perhaps about to change when the millennials are entering, entering the market, so to say. And then Mike's point, which was really important, that there's really no pressure to adopt technology as much because uh, because uh, arbitration is still very much a tailored product, and as long as the in-house councils are saying that they do not want to push for technology as long as it's uncertain, then the culture is... Yeah. is I think the tools stuck. are there, but the, the, cul the cultural issue is, is a reality. You have to accept it. Not everyone's comfortable using technology. It will improve, it will get better, the systems will get smarter, it'll be easier to use. But that is going to take time. How long is it on that cycle? I'm not quite sure. But it, 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 is, it is a fact I think we have to recognize. And as a client, would you want to use a technology which is a little bit uncertain? You've just said no. And many clients would do that. But on our American arbitration service that we run, the insurance companies absolutely love it because it provides consistency, it's a robust system, it delivers results in a quick time. And interesting, one point about video technology, we don't use video technology in our platform, largely not because there's someone standing in the background telling you what you can do, but a lot of online dispute resolution is all about tracking events and actions and decisions which are taking place. And if you've got a, an automated system, which really particularly important in these smaller insurance-based arbitrations where steps are, are taken, 
the system records all those steps, so you can do a retrospective analysis of what happened, what are the stages, what are the timelines, which steps of the arbitration procedure took place at which time. If that's all tracked and managed in a case, you can deliver reports, and the insurance companies love those reports because they can use that to inform future decisions and how they approach these cases. That's not artificial intelligence taking over, that's using data which the system tracks as the case goes through, and then it's reviewed and analyzed by an analyst afterwards, and that will inform how the insurance companies can measure risk and take decisions on, on, a, on a board level about what level of you know, revenue they need to set aside to mitigate against these cases. So that's where technology does work uh, uh, very well. Uh, I'll add one, one thing. The technology is not culturally neutral. No. You know, it's well. imbued with the culture of the person who creates it. Uh, and so it really matters, actually, you know, who, who is creating it, what sources they're relying to create it, uh, and, and, and checking it, certainly, in the international arbitration community uh, against others. So I'll, just as a, as a brief example, and this is, you know, in some ways, it's a platform, but this is a low-tech example. We were developing the survey, uh, the questionnaire, and we had a number of questions that, you know, I had blinders on, thought were culturally neutral. Um, but in fact, you, we, we had a, a global public uh, comment period and a number of people commented, well, actually, your question here about the arbitrators asking questions assumes they'll be asking questions, and in fact, in our part of the world, uh, it's, not the, it's not common. And so you shouldn't have a, any background assumption that any questions will be asked at all. Uh, or you should, you know, and certainly in, in parts of the world, there's zero document production. And so you have to build into any tools that you create, any technological tools. And then also when you talk about artificial intelligence, which I think is still quite a, quite a ways off, uh, you know, some of the some of what they created, they found uh, the artificial intelligence was quite real in its racism. And it was because the information that they had to feed, okay, to train the tool uh, was off the internet. <laughs> and it was not filtered to strain out. A lot of what's on the internet, you know, was, was, was racially biased or gender biased. And so you have to be particularly, I think, sensitive to that. And it is a, uh, an infinitely more complex process when you're operating in a culturally rich, you know, transnational environment like international arbitration. I think that raises an important point, especially the idea that technology applications are always made in the image of their makers. Uh, Mera, I'd like to pose this question to you. Uh, do you think legal design would be a way to solve these two issues, the first being the anxiety of, of lawyers adopting technology? So making it more intuitive could perhaps help with the culture shock. Mm -hmm. And then the second question, do you think legal design could help with the point that Catherine raised, the idea that uh, the developer's perspective is always inherent to the applications? Well, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I do think so. I think um, going back to, what was your first question about the culture? Anxiety. An anxiety. Yes, so I th I th it will definitely address anxiety, mainly, um, especially if the makers of the technology also are co-creating, which is becoming a, a, a lot of a bigger trend these days, actually working with clients or the end user, and they're co-creating with the people who will be using that technology. Um, not only is it then more likely that the technology will be something that people will adopt and feel less anxious about, but it's also likely to be more business efficient because you're likely to create something that will really work, thereby saving resources and time as well. And that's something that the whole legal design process really embraces. And it is just about making sure that all these different um, stakeholders creating solutions work together um, and take into account the different perspectives and, and really, yeah, designing for the end user, but also taking into account, you know, the technology and how that can match the end user's needs. I think that would, it would absolutely address anxiety, especially if we, um, within the legal sector, take on a bit more of a collaborative approach with the people who are using our services. That would be a way that we could, yeah, address that anxiety. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we are starting to be a bit short on time, uh, so I have one last question to, to the panelists before opening the floor for audience questions. 
So my last question is, what should arbitrators do? And what should arbitration institutes and lawyers do next to stay up to speed about these developments? Where should you put your efforts in? Well, I think from um, arbitrators and arbitration practice concerned, I think just be mindful that these developments are coming. I think as far as arbitration organizations are concerned, I definitely think uh, dialogue um, and looking at more innovative ways to managers, manage the services that you offer um, should include discussions around um, e-filing, particularly as a starting point, because that's a service which could be set up and managed very, very efficiently for small and large cases. And just participate in, in the growth. It is happening. Um, I made some notes earlier on about, you know, we're talking about shaping the future. You know, the future's already happening. You know, the, you know the, the, we have lots of different analogies today, but, you know, we are already running online arbitration programs very, very successfully. Um, it might be in single jurisdictions, but it's still a successful start, and that is going to filter out, and it's going to, over the next four or five years, I think will make a big a big impact. That would be my recommendation to this, certainly the organization. Yeah, and, and building on from what you just said, um, yeah, you know, the future doesn't just happen, we create it and we are in the driving seat to create whatever will be in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years time. And so I, I really like your point about being an active participant. And there are, as you said, Catherine, different adoption rates to technology and to change. Um, and if it is something that perhaps you yourself know, it, something you may, you know, tread a bit more um, hesitantly towards, we as lawyers, we are trained to be risk adverse. So it's in our nature to just want to hold back a little bit longer. Um, but, you know, just, just be an active participant and embrace it. Um, it will be different for different generations as well. Uh, there are generations coming into the workforce who do not know the world without the internet, you know? <laughs> so they're going to be much more, um, yeah, much more open-minded and much more eager to adopt these technology, um, technological ways to progress within the industry. And I think for those of us in different generations, it would be great to then actually work more together, you know, harness off everyone's strengths to keep the industry progressing in the way that we want to so we can shape the future. Yeah. Beautiful. So my answer is very in you know, easy. If you are an in-house counsel or a lawyer, fill out our AIQs. <laughs> if you're an arbitrator, uh, we will be, before we publish reports about arbitrators, we'll be uh, asking you to consent to comply with EU data protection laws and, and whatnot, and also just out of fairness. So if you're an arbitrator, consent. Uh, if you are a, an institution, sign one of our collaboration agreements. So you send out emails inviting people to fill out questionnaires at the end, and we will give you free data when we have it. Uh, it was a pretty good deal. Uh, and that's what I would recommend for future actions of everyone in the room. <laughs> totally so unself-interested. <laughs> Clemens, you want to? Well, with Take so the last word. <laughs> too much honor from me. With, <laughs> and with so uh, brilliant pre speakers, it's very difficult to add something. So, my, my suggestion is very simple just let's all try to make um, smart use of technology. And that is, of course, also something where the institutions are competing with each other. There is a number of global, of regional institutions. And as I said earlier, they all are open to technology, but if they actively offer this, for example, they can distinguish from others. For example, data management, e-data management, yeah? Of course, if I tell the attorneys or the attorneys propose to me, let's set up an e-data room, they do it. They will find a service provider and so on. And for a big case, that might be not the, the driver. But in this smaller, medium cases, if the institution says, we have the platform available, which is open to all our users, so you don't need to set it up. It's here. It is certified. It is uh, safe. That is something which certainly users will like. It also lowers their costs, makes it easier. So th that was just one example for my message. Let's try to make it efficient, and, and, and therefore let's try to make smart use of the available technology, always being open for innovations. Perfect. Thank you. Now, is there any audience questions? So the gentleman and then the lady. 
ladies first. <laughs> Um, yes, Nisha Bastier from Hanotier and Vandenberg. First of all, thank you very much for each of your very interesting project presentations. And um, uh, since no one asks you any questions, Rika, <laughs> I have a question for you in particular. <laughs> um, before I get to that, I have one um, question for Catherine, because um, I, have, I think it's, it's very important, the transparency point, the opening up the pool of potential new candidates for um, uh, um, arbitrator appointments. It's very, very, very uh, crucial. Uh, the only thing that I, where I have my concern, mm -hmm. and um, putting it out to you, you might have heard of it uh, maybe earlier already from others, is that uh, the transparency, of course, should be the most efficient transparency and should also be reflective of reality. So the collection um, of the data about a certain arbitrator, about document disclosure or the speed and timing of rendering an award, it's, it can be very, very space, um, case specific, obviously. Um, and so document production, in one case, I would think, no, it's, there is enough document already um, in the record. Um, or, and so I'm more restrictive. In another case, I would think, no, well, the, one of the parties for sure is hiding something. So uh, as a member of the tribunal, we want to more, uh, know more. And the speed, as you know, has, especially if you're not a sole arbitrator, you have dissents, you don't always have a consensus immediately, mm -hmm. uh, you don't have always uh, um, available colleagues on, on mm -hmm. the tribunal. So that's something that uh, um, as, song, as long as the questionnaire is and the data collection and the outcome is refined enough, mm -hmm. I think that's a very, very, very important yeah. and very useful tool um, as opposed to a uh, generalization about one specific arbitrator's conduct yeah. derived from all the different cases. Yeah. That's one question. Okay. And can, then, yes? Yeah. Can I continue uh, with the question for you yeah, or not? The time's up, but very oh. quick question and very short answers from us. Very quick question is the algorithm, the bias, the human bias behind it, but you mentioned, Rika. And I also understand that in uh, your project, you are focusing on that perspective right now. Um, and I was very happy to read that you mentioned interdisciplinary research group on this bias, on the algorithm as well, um, how you put it together and also obviously the, the outcome on the um, automated justice and who is behind it and how can it develop further if we always look at the same cases and um, then there would be always the same answer uh, and the same decision for each case. So I would be very interested to know how your interdisciplinary research group tackles that. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, do you want to give a brief? So, sure. Let me just give a really quick answer, which is this is obviously a really important uh, question. And it is one that we've thought quite a bit about. So we ask a number of detailed questions about the background of the case. You know, what was the dollar amount in dispute? What was the industry? What were the rules that were applicable? Uh, on, and, and when we are essentially analyzing the data, we can triangulate with, with those, or filter, you might say, with that, that, those questions to get at exactly what you're saying. And in response to Michael's questionnaire, as I understand, the number one answer to every single question on your questionnaire was, it depends on the case, and that comma, and then they would start elaborating. So it, it absolutely depends on the case, and that's part of why I think this is an improvement over phone calls. Phone calls, you know what happened in that case, but you don't know uh, in other cases with different variables uh, if you don't get those phone calls through. And then um, the, the other part, um, uh, I forgot the second part of your question. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but anyways, it's, it is something that I think, I mean, the short answer is we ask questions so that we can get drilled down on. Oh, I know what I was going to say. The number one question, one of the questions I always get is from arbitrators on the timing question. Can we fill out a question? Because I'd love to tell you that it was not my fault that this award was late, but my co-arbitrator. And we, arbitrators are not allowed to fill out the questionnaire because we think that would require confidential information, but we've gotten the question so much, I have not ruled out the possibility that at some point in the future, with party cons both parties' consent, uh, that, they might, uh, that there might be an abbreviated arbitrator questionnaire. But it's amazing how many arbitrators have asked that question. And so we will have disclaimers, 
right? And we will have, and also if you have, you have 17 awards and they're all timely, but one is out, you know it's not the arbitrator's fault, right? So that's the answer. Okay, and just quickly about algorithms. Uh, so it's a very popular debate uh, to say that algorithms are repeating structural biases that are inherent in the input data that is used, and I understood that this question is linked with that. Uh, in, it's a question that both computer scientists and lawyers are trying to, or legal scholars are trying to solve. Uh, and the question is, of course, that where do we solve it? So is it uh, on the level of technological architectures? where we can point out which parts, which functions are discriminatory? Or is it a question of, of legal scholarship to figure out how do we regulate these systems? Uh, we believe it's a combination of several elements. So fairness is, algorithmic fairness is something that is not simply about computer or data science, but it's also about law. And that's why we need to approach these themes together, but that makes, that is the challenge of interdisciplinary work. So when I talk with my colleagues about discrimination, uh, the computer scientists understand the word very differently than I do. So it takes a lot of work, and the first part is to develop a grammar so that we can understand each other. I think the precedent issue is not uh, that critical because it's also a question of of how much do we automate. And like this panel actually concluded, uh, the first stage is not going to be that we're going to automate whole dispute resolution processes. Uh, and even if we are to do that at some point, then the question is, how do we get enough feedback back to the system to make sure that it doesn't just keep on repeating same mistakes again and again? But so on that note, I would like to thank first and first the organizers for letting us have this very, imp oh, there's one last question. <laughs> Heidi and Petra, don't kill us. <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> yes, Ralph Lindberg for Bad Corporation. Uh, I'll keep it very short here. Uh, you mentioned where technology kicks in. Now in-house, most likely in scenario buildings. Predictive analytics when it comes to legal outcomes. And I think that's not a very fast stretch. I need to look at my colleague Tim Williams here. We're doing it already. Uh, second, we expect the legal industry to be responsive to that type of modeling so that we get the reality testing. Sorry? Reality testing with yeah. you know, the legal industry, outside counsel, whosoever. Uh, we, 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 we take the approach, maximize, outcome, minimize outcome. We build in variables, uh, not only legal ones, but also forex, costs, oil price index, whatever. The point being that in, in this, you know, what these tools will do for us in-house is that we come to the legal industry with a plate which is much more sophisticated and much more, I would say, ready-made or digested, <laughs> and we expect the feedback to be on a similar level from the legal industry in the future, mm -hmm. so that dispute resolution becomes part of a value chain. Mm -hmm. Isn't that more or less what we are doing? There was a lady. You want to answer? I think that's, that's a very... Um, um, Valid point, actually, to actually use that really coming from an industry perspective, really just st starting to to uh, structure that information and make sure that relationship or that informa uh, that interaction with the law firms are, and your yeah. counsel is much is much clearer. It's a much more succinct uh, communication package. Exactly. Exactly, and, and then coming back to your point that, that what cannot be done, I mean, we have the individual, we have the person there, absolutely right. We just mm -hmm. call it the customer. Mm -hmm. We cannot use artificial intelligence to model the customer, yeah. but our side of the fence is definitely something where we can do a lot on scenario building, and their legal technology will kick in very fast. We are already doing it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, there's, oh, there's one more bold hand. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, as far as I understand, 
it is given that technology can be utilized very far, but as you all in the panel have indicated, there are limits for using technology and the uh, digital improvements. And, and uh, we will, what will be the limit? What would you say that the limits are for using technology from the viewpoint at which we are presently? Uh, I'm thinking about such principles as uh, those about uh, fair dealing and good faith and so forth. Uh, I understood that, okay, insurance companies in the U.S., uh, within their sphere of jurisdiction, have been using technology very far so far. And then it was mentioned that uh, Air companies, they use uh, technology and digitalization for certain claims when planes have been delayed. And all those are simple matters. And within a certain area, certain jurisdiction with certain customs and usances. But you can't ever cover the whole world and the whole uh, human brain activity, let's say, on questions of reasonableness. Um, that I mentioned good faith and fair dealing and so forth because uh, in arbitration it's not about finding a legal solution generally but a legitimate solution and this is the difference uh, as far as I can see what's your opinion thank you so well, that, take it. that's that's 100 percent correct Tom. I think getting a using technology to to provide a platform or an infrastructure to to make a legal solution as we've got in the US. I think it does work well, but those are processes which are still made by human arbitrators. There's no artificial intelligence involved in that, although some of the aggregation of data and the analysis which takes place of the documents might make the arbitrator's job easier and quicker, but it's never supplanting their their judgment role. We also do a lot of work in digitizing uh, court systems in the U.S. Our, our software runs about 60% of the U.S. court uh, estate, and that's all just about, again, pulling uh, data together and just allowing judges to exercise their, their, their judgments in, in the most efficient way, having available access. And we haven't really spoken about pro se litigants and litigants in person and access to justice. Those are all other very big legal principles which will also need to be considered in the grander scheme of things. Yeah, yeah probably looking more broader, you asked um, to what extent technology, um, to the extent that we don't become slaves to it. I think we always need to be in charge of technology. So using technology, um, but using it where there's a clear business purpose and a clear need. Um, I, I don't think there's a point in using tech for tech's sake, saying, oh, we're doing this and this. Um, as long as there's a natural business purpose, it's making processes more efficient, deriving better outcomes, and then actually addressing a certain and specific need. I think that's how technology should be utilised, and I think that'll be the way that we can really shape every industry in a positive way. Okay. I'm going to pass on that one. Okay. I've already spoken so much. I think Mera's note was such a positive and beautiful one, so <laughs> we'll end up here. So thank you, organizers. Uh, thank Absolutely. you, our wonderful panelists, and thank you for your interest. <laughs>